Hi everybody and welcome back to the Two Naughties podcast. I am your host Jay Vizeno, joined by my co-host Timmy Long. Hi everyone. Uh, this is our first international guest, is Professor Baz Dreisinger from John Jay College of Criminal Justice in the University of New York. She is an academic, teacher, activist, author, among other things. How are you today, Baz? I'm fantastic. It's great to be here. Brilliant to have you. Um, I suppose one of the... One quick story before we get started, as I was saying off camera, we were drawing up a, a wish list of international speakers and yourself and Gabo Mate was at the top. First two emails I sent out <laughs> and I got two positive replies. So you're first and we have Gabo Mate on in a couple of weeks. So that was great. So we really appreciate you coming on. But one of the things that one of the programs that you've set up over in New York is the prison to school pipeline. Um, we have something similar enough in Cork, which was really uh, uh, started out in America as well. It's the Inside Out Prison Exchange Program. Is your program similar to that? Yeah, it is. Well, first of all, I'm honored to be your first international guest. Um, it's such a pleasure and uh, it's great to talk to you guys today. I'm a big fan of of Ireland in general. So I'm going to imagine that I'm virtually in your country for the moment um, and I hope to be back soon. <laughs> Uh, but yes, I started a program uh, 11 years ago in the U.S. in New York at John Jay called the Prison to College Pipeline Program, um, which would translate really as prison to university. I know that college and university um, are, are different things um, across the pond. But um, the idea of the program is it's a university program inside prison. Uh, so students begin university while in prison, and then they're guaranteed a place in university uh, in the City University of New York system when they come home. So it's both a u education program and a reintegration program. And so it's quite, there are other models um, around the world and in the U.S. that are similar. Um, I think what makes or what made the prison to college program unique when I first started it was the focus on reintegration, was that it was about um, kind of making the best of both worlds in terms of offering university to, and education to somebody while he or she was inside, but then also kind of making education the centerpiece of somebody's reentry, reintegration back into the world and all of the things that a campus has to offer um, to somebody coming home from prison, which is actually sort of how I thought of the thing in the first place. I was walking around my campus at John Jay back in the days when we were physically on campus. And, and I thought to myself, you know, there's so many resources here. And, um, you know, whether it's uh, free healthcare opportunities, free food, um, tutoring mm -hmm. opportunities, mental health care, you know, it's in, in the U.S. campuses and, and university is one of the few times in life when you're offered free services. We are not the land of social services. So, um, and I said, well, who better to benefit from that um, and, and while contributing to that than the community that's coming home from prison? And that's kind of how the idea of the program was born. Excellent. And, you know, do the prisoners, um, when they they have they start the course while in prison and then when they're freed, they go to the college or university. Is that under some sort of a scholarship or how is that funded? Yeah, so we cover the tu um, tuition is covered for the students while they're incarcerated. Um, at this point, well, there's been shifts in funding around the politics of education in prisons in the U.S., um, so when I launched the program, there was no, um, you were not eligible for what we call financial aid or bursaries while you're in prison. Uh, and since then, the law has shifted uh, somewhat in various stages over the last decade and change. Um, and so now the program is actually federally funded. So you are eligible for um, financial assistance from the government in the same way that you were if you were a student on the outside. Um, and so now we can say that the program is fully funded from, uh, you know, federally funded from start to finish. And so the idea being, of course, that just because you're learning in prison, you're doesn't make you a different kind of student from a student who's in the community. If someone in the community is eligible for the financial assistance, then while you're in prison, the same thing applies. And is it is it all um, liberal arts type of courses? It's a full range. Uh, there, you you can get. I mean, we've had students over 
over the years. Um, and I should say, you know, it's a program that's constantly in evolution and growing and, and shifting and which I think any program, um, any education program has to be period, let alone an education program in a prison context. Um, but it, you know, students have studied everything from media, law, um, you know, healthcare and, and, um, social sciences, criminal justice. It's really quite the range. Um, in the, in, while they're in prison, the program was designed such that while they're in prison, they complete their kind of general education requirements, which is something also fairly unique to the U S we have a very broad general education. You don't only specialize, um, when you're in university. And then when they come out, they kind of focus on what we call your major. Um, so, so, the, and they have all of that stuff under their belt, but the idea of the program is, I mean, I think most people who go to university don't necessarily know what they really want to study yet. So we want to expose them to lots of things yep. and then they can determine, you know, what direction to go in. But, and I also think that a lot of times, um, I've encountered this, not just in the U S but in, in college programs, university programs all around the world, that a lot of times incarcerated students think that they want to go into, um, you know, social service professions, counseling, so on and so forth, which is great, but it's often because that's all they've been exposed to, right. As by virtue of being incarcerated, um, you know, they've seen a ton of social workers and they've had a lot of things foisted on them. So that's their only world. But we want to say that you can be anything. You can be a rocket scientist. You can be, you know, an animator. You can be a filmmaker. You can whatever it is. So we really support that. Um, how does that work, Buzz, around the guard vetting system in the US then? Say, for example, back here in Ireland, if somebody has been in prison, they're really limited in terms of what job they can have when they when they come out of prison and um, for example i i um when i came out of prison i decided to do a degree no i didn't go down the social system i went down um a construction route um construction management but n back in ireland some companies do some form of vetting as well for 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 new people coming into their companies you know and Towards the end of my degree, I was kind of caught up in my head thinking about, am I going to be rejected? You know, um, who's going to take me because of my criminal record? I, I wasn't, wasn't thinking of all the positive things that I'd done in my life um, to get me where I was, you know. So how does it actually work over in the US? Say, for example, as you said there, you're trying to broaden um, the, the amount of courses that people choose instead of just going down the social route. How d is there some form of system that you have over there that looks at, say, for people that are coming from prison and have done all these different courses and whatever? Is there a system to say, no, do you know what? This person has done that in the past. Nowadays, they're, they're sober eight, nine, ten years. They have done this in college. They have done all these different courses. They have seen psychotherapists or psychologists or whatever for a number of years. Does that help in any way? Yeah, such an important no, question. I wish I had here. better news for you. Um, but mm. it's the same, you know, it's the same in the U.S. as it is from what I'm hearing um, in Ireland and really, frankly, all over the world, which is that there's rampant discrimination. There's rampant barriers uh, against entry into certain professions. It's a never ending battle. And so our attitude, and I guess, you know, in some ways I'm just speaking in part of, there's a large movement here in the U S to battle that what we call it's, it's come to be known as the ban the box movement. Um, and the box being the box that you have to check on the application, you know, for whether you have a criminal conviction. Um, so whether that's a school application, a job application, whatever it is, and so um, some of the some of the barriers are more formal barriers, like official barriers uh, that you cannot, you know, go into such and such profession. Some are more informal, like you just know they're going to do a background check and they're going to prevent you. Um, and so I think our, our attitude is the only way to battle that is to just keep on keeping on and to challenge legally those kinds of discriminations at every turn. Um, and what we found is that a lot of the barriers, you can still get through the loophole in order to then challenge the large structural, um, you know, the, the obstacle. 
And so, for instance, we I have a, a student right now I'm very, very close to. Um, he was the, in the first cohort of the program 11 years ago, and he's in law school right now on a full scholarship. In, in the U.S., you know, you go to university first and then go to law school. And so there is still a chance. He just got accepted last year, started this year on a full scholarship, which is almost unheard of in, in the U.S. Uh, law school is quite expensive. And, you know, he went through quite an internal battle over, do I pursue this? I really want to do this. He wants to pursue um, defense work. Uh, he wants to be a defender because he didn't get a good public defense, right? Like so many people in the system. And so that's his passion. Um, but he was worried because the fact of the matter is he could go through all of the schooling, all of the qualifications, and then um, due to the barriers, be denied entry to the profession. So, um, which is an enormous tragedy, of course. But our thinking is that there are enough precedents now. There's enough support in the community. He has enough support in terms of our educational community um, and the movement at large that we feel confident that he's going to be able to do it. And I think the more programs there are like this and the more people getting education, the more people pursuing, you know, challenging barriers, um, the better. But it's not, it's no easy road. I've never been anywhere in the world where it's an easy road. The discrimination, whether it's legalized discrimination or de facto discrimination still exists. Um, but the bigger the movement grows, the more the resistance grows to that, you know? And I think also the more exactly. the culture changes in terms of acceptance of people coming home. Um, and that they're seen in the public light as not, you know, for, quote, ex-cons and so on, much bigger than that, that shifts the whole um, dynamic and the culture and, and promotes acceptance. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We have, um, like, one of the points you touched on there was a lot of people that have been through experiences like myself, Timmy, and the people that you work with, they tend to go down the social route in terms of social workers, youth workers, community work, um, working in homeless service, addiction services. We have a criminologist based in Ireland here. He's actually American, Shad Maruna, and he writes about the wounded healer, you know, and like people, you know, they come out of that hardship with a lot of gratitude and they want to give back, you know, and I think that's maybe why when I was going through my uh, my university degrees and I was reading about that, I could really identify with what Shad was writing about there. But I was listening to you speak on another interview you done on YouTube when I was researching for the show, and you spoke about um, people that have been in prison or that are, that are in prison. They make great students because they've been in an in intellectual void for so long, um, and the stakes are really high, so they take it really serious. And I remember when I was going through college, like I had very first tunnel vision. You know, I got very good grades as Timmy did. You know, we really thrived in the university environment and people always used to often say, you know, how do you, you know, go through university or college for six or seven years? It's like, what, what's the alternative? You know, the stakes are that high. You're trying to redefine your life, redefine your personality and your character, but they do make good students. They make great employees too, because they will be very loyal. They will be very grateful and they will work so hard to make sure that you made the right choice. And they're going to make sure that, you know, that, um, it's validated. Would that be your experience? Well, I definitely, I mean, I, as a professor, I've been spoiled being able to teach in prison. So, um, and every other faculty member that I've, you know, uh, given access to do the same would say exactly the same thing, um, that they are the best students that I've been privileged to, um, to learn with. I can't even say to teach because it's a two-way learning process. Um, and it always has been. And I'm very, you know, I, I'm no longer, I passed the torch um, of the prison to college pipeline to my dear colleagues to run it because I'm, you know, very busy with global work. But uh, I am still deeply involved in the lives of, of my former students. Um, and I, I dedicated my book to them. And I said, I called them my, you know, my family, my students and my teachers. And um, so it's really a two-way process. And I think that the other thing is that 
as you say, yes, people coming, you know, I mean, we've, we've locked away the best and brightest, like that's just a fact. We've warehoused away the best and brightest. And so when you talk about, you know, a workforce, when you talk about a creative force, when you talk about um, a, a, a classroom, um, who better than the, the best and brightest? And I don't think it even has to be a matter of being so mm-hmm. grateful you know, because it's not like, you know, that that makes me think of like almost the happy slave mentality. I'm so grateful for the opportunity. No, you mm. employer should be grateful for our genius. That should be, mm. the, you know, the attitude. You know what yep. I mean? Um, and 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 the same. I, I, the professor, I'm grateful for that learning environment um, that has enriched my life as much as it has enriched theirs. How do you deal with issues of um poor literacy um dyslexia because in my experience in irish prisons the rate of literacy would be very low level levels of educational attainment would be low to non-existent would that be your experience in new york as well and is it really starting from the basics with those people yeah i mean i'm i'm not the best person to speak to that because i know you know issues of learning disabilities is not something that i've dealt with a tremendous amount and i think there were occasions where we faced it in our various classrooms and i'm going to be the first to admit that i don't think we did a very good job because we um were so busy sort of holding the program together um but i know it's something that now there's a lot more attention being paid to it. As far as literacy issues, um, that also I, we weren't addressing because in order to get into our program, you had to have attained a certain level of that. Um, and the and one thing in the U.S. that mm. we're actually decent at is giving people pre-university level access to education inside prisons uh, and to some extent literacy skills. Although I think broadly speaking, it's the thing that's not spoken about, um, you know, this issue of, of um, literacy. But I think that often, and you bring attention to such an important issue, often these programs are so sort of busy keeping themselves afloat that people will get lost, you know, fall through the cracks as a result of those things. And so I'm glad that now I'm seeing a lot more work being done in that space um, in, in terms of uh, learning disabilities and challenges and uh, and also addressing of literacy. The, my work in literacy has been more uh, in an international context, international prison context, where that is more of an obvious issue of, you know, really failed school systems. And that's how I see it. This is about failed school systems. You know, I, I think of the um, pro- education in prison is about giving people what they were meant to get all along. Right. We're all guaranteed access Mm. to education, Mm. allegedly, as citizens of whatever country we live in. And yet we know that's not the case due to race and class and all of these, you know, systemic barriers toward um, education. And so the idea is to give people what they should have gotten in the very first place if we didn't live in such an unequal society. Yeah, you said there that you, you do a lot of international work at the moment. In your experience, is there any consistent feature among prison population in all the countries? I, I know like in, in the Irish context, again, because that's what we're familiar with the most, it tends to be people in poor neighborhoods or people in areas where there's high social housing, um, where we have a lot of Irish travel. We've like small percentage of Irish travelers in the population, but a huge percent of them in the prison population. Um, we have a lot of Polish people, Nigerians, you know, ethnic minorities. So if you're looking at the most prejudiced, discriminated, socially excluded groups, that's what makes up the prison population in Ireland. I know from watching documentaries you know, in, in America, it's quite similar. Is that consistent throughout all uh, the countries you visited? Definitely. And I'm glad you brought up that reality in Ireland, because often the ignorant American looks over at a place like Ireland and says, Oh, but the prisons are all white there. That's not similar to what we have in the U.S. Um, and without, because they don't recognize that whiteness, you know, is is a, is also um, touches on class and nationality and and opportunity. Um, there's nowhere I haven't been. Everywhere I've been in the world, it's been a matter of a designated other that has been produced for prison cells. Um, so whether that designated other is, of course, in the U.S. this historic and ongoing legacy of African-Americans and now um, Latinx, what we call Latinx people, people of uh, Latino, Latina descent. 
being produced for prison cells, but it also applies to the populations you just described, the have-nots. So whether it's poor people in parts of the world, um, foreign foreigners, like you mentioned, Polish, Eastern European people in a, even a place like Norway, um, whether we're talking about Aboriginal people in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, whether we're talking about women um, in, you know, particularly countries, say, in Southeast Asia, uh, there are targeted populations that have been designated as the other and, um, and funneled directly into prison cells. So it operates almost the same way everywhere. And then when we bring capitalism and labor into the mix, you start to understand some, to some extent why that is. But it's also very much just about social control and oppression and saying these people, you know, we need to keep them down, whoever the these people is in a given cultural context. Yeah. One thing, one thing that we don't have that America do have or does have is huge prison sentences. Now, I think like you can't get big sentences here. You, you can't get life means life. You don't get 25 to life or three strikes or anything like that. When, you're, when you're, we're looking at um, American documentaries, which are popular enough in Ireland, you know, and you're looking at uh, an 18 to 19 year old, he's doing 15 to 20 years for an armed robbery or somebody's doing 25 to life for three three uh, felony charges. Some of the sentences are mind-blowing. Um, is that a legacy of privatization of prisons or is that just, is that even in states where there isn't privatization of prisons? Um, great question. It's, uh, first and foremost, it's a legacy of America's punitive uh, culture and its obsession with punishment. And I think that, you know, we are, we are a nation that has been grounded on that. Um, if anything, it's also a legacy of slavery, being that uh, incarceration is a direct descendant of slavery. And so if you can enslave somebody for life, why can't you lock them up for life, right? Uh, and that's where I think, first and foremost, the, the long sentences in the U.S. come from. And then when it becomes part of the culture, it becomes painfully normalized. You know, I mean, I just had a student come home after 30 years, 30 years. Uh, and while everybody says, wow, he's still not the only one in his community who's done that amount of time. So we have normalized this, you know, this this really vile thing in an incredible way. Um, and, and, and that's enormously distressing. I don't think it's necessarily related to privatization. Uh, privatization, I mean, the, the prison industrial complex is alive, well, thriving everywhere. Um, but one important thing to note, and of course, it's a whole other, uh, you know, monster to, to talk about and dissect, but it is, we are phasing out the use of private prisons in the U.S., but the capitalist system, you know, money making has made its way into every facet of the state system. So it doesn't have to be a private prison to be a money maker, you know. So everything from the food, the health care, um, the, you know, the, the, the debit cards that are being used for people's commissary and release funds, which are, uh, you know, run through J.P. Morgan Chase, like every facet of the system is in, 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 ensnared in capitalism and in money making. So there is certainly a, you know, a, a great financial incentive for prisons to keep on running and for people to be locked up. Although there's just as much incentive to keep it be short sentences. I know that in the UK and Ireland, you know, part of the, pro, the, the, the short sentences just produce this ro revolving door, um, which we have as well. And that can be just as money making as a long sentence. Um, this constant process of arraignments and this and that and, you know, which destroy a person's life as much as 30 years behind bars does. Although, you know, it's, it's impossible to quantify such a thing, but, but you, you catch my drift. You yeah. Know when, you know, when you say private prisons um, in the U.S., are they owned by uh, companies, uh, corporations, is it? And do, are they paid? Are they paid then by the government to hold prisoners? Is it? Baz. Yes. Um, so their private prison companies are, you know, they, 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 prisons are one thing that they do. 
Um, but they also may run security. They may run, um, you know, one of the biggest money makers in the industry now are ankle monitoring devices. So they produce those. Um, so pri- the actual private prison itself, the private facility itself, many of which are being closed right now in the U.S. and certainly under Biden, it was one of his um, you know, new flashy things to do was to stop contracts with private prisons, um, which is lovely, but it's like 1%, 0.01% of the problem. Uh, so it's all of these companies mm. that aren't necessarily even known. Um, Secure Us is one of them. It's a company that deals with prison phone calls that also creates uh, tablets uh, for use in prison. So, you know, they release these tablets into the prison population so that incarcerated people can access movies and learning and whatever it is, but then they have to pay for it. And there's a big company making lots of money off of that um, instead of giving that to people for free. When I heard you say a private, I was just kind of wondering what it actually meant until you said capitalism. Then I, I realized that it was a money making machine for the rich again. Like, so thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's like the truth of the matter is our governments in the world today are bought out by companies anyway. So they're, you know, our our states are, you know, controlled by these same corporations that are making money off prison. So it's all like everything is embroiled in that, you know, in that greed. I, I'm going to talk to you about some of your international work there, your book, Incarceration Nations, which is a fabulous book. I've been accessing it through Audible um, while I was off my walks and doing my little workouts and stuff here. But um, some of the some of the prisons, they were so harsh um, that it was very hard to understand. Like, I remember there was one lady in Thailand, she got caught with two Yaba tablets and she was doing a life sentence. And the conditions in the Brazilian prison were like very harsh as well. Um, but in the Brazilian prison, they had an interesting program where prisoners could read a book and write a report on the book to get time off their sentence. Yeah. Um, although in the book, I well, thank you for your kind words about my book. Um, I think in that in the book, I kind of end up critiquing that program as you know, kind of like lipstick on a pig. I mean. The, the conditions I saw, and in, in the book I wrote about the Brazilian supermaxes, which are not the norm. Um, there, are yep. fi- they, they are, there are five of them in Brazil, and they're uh, quite expensive to run and quite awful places of torture. You know, I mean, solitary confinement is torture, nothing, you know, nothing short of torture. And what I saw there was, you know, embodied all of those things. And I think the truth of the matter is I mainly use that program as an excuse to get into that prison um, because I, and to present to them, oh, I hear you've got this progressive program. So, um, you know, full, full disclosure, I kind of knew that the, the, the program, I'm allowed to curse on your program, right? Well, I, I knew that it would be you bullshit are, are. Um, <laughs> from the get go. Like I, I, you know, so Anything that's getting people out of prison even a day earlier, you know, I, I'm in favor of. But that was ultimately just something that they put on to smooth out the other evil things that were happening in that context. Uh, so and I've seen a lot of that all over the world and, you know, in horrific conditions. I think a lot of times governments uh, and prison systems want to make themselves look better. So they find some little pretty thing that they can, you know, smooth out some little rehabilitation program or whatever it is. And everybody can pat themselves on the back and pretend that they're actually doing the work of correctional services when we know that they're not. I mean, you all know this better, far better than I do. Um, But I saw this all over the world. Yeah. I remember years ago, around 2005 in in Ireland, we had a very uh, conservative government the progressive Democrats was in a coalition and uh, the Minister for Justice at the time, he's um, he's a barrister, but his name is Michael McDool and he was going around to the, the prisons at the time and I was in Cork Prison and Cork Prison was an old Victorian building. There was no toilets in the cells, no running water in the cells. This type of, it was a bad facility. But uh, when he was due in to visit, they painted the whole <laughs> place. All the overcrowding was 
vanished. People got transferred around the country and everything was immaculate. And he came, done his little 10 minute walk around the prison. And within a week, people were on the floors, there was shit up the walls. And it was, so it's kind of something similar to that. You know, it's just a, a small little thing, as you said, putting lipstick on a pig, which is a great way of putting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah brilliant. Yeah, I've, I've been in so many situations like that as the, as the outside visitor that they were painting up the prison for, you know. Um, but thankfully, I mean, I think anyone with half, half a brain and two eyes can see through that. Um, and so I think also when something, when a system is that rotten, it's going to stink, you know, no layer of paint is going to cover that up. And I think, you know, what's, I can, what you said reminded me of a, a time fairly recently, probably one of the last prisons I was in before the pandemic closed off access was in the Bahamas. And, uh, the Bahamas is a country that it's a fairly wealthy country. You know, there is poverty, but it's not you know, dramatically widespread. They've got all that offshore banking and so on. Um, and I went into the prison there and it was truly one of the most shocking sights in my life. I still have nightmares about it. I mean, they really had people in chicken coops and, um, you know, people were just screaming out and it was clear that they had not been let out of that chicken coop like environment in, um, in days. And Mm -hmm. it was so horrifyingly awful. And, come to find out that that was a better version of what, that normally there's literally shit all over the place, um, you know, and, and far worse, but it was unfathomable. I mean, if that's the cleaned up version for the visitors, then I I can't even imagine Mm. the, the regular one. So in, in your opinion, uh, that was probably one of the worst prisons what from all the prisons um that you did visit what prison stuck out as in a real um they were really looking after their prisoners in a sense that they were educating them they were helping them with their mental health issues addiction issues what country or what prison really showed you that they cared about um their prisoners in a sense that they wanted them to rehabilitate and get well with their mental health um, and if they had drug problems and if they wanted to educate themselves where, where, well, I'd say where first, would have been that place well I, I'd say first and foremost the countries that aren't just shipping ever or not even the you know the countries where to some degree they're not just shipping everybody off to prison in the first place so my what first comes to mind is not prisons it's alternative to incarceration programs that exist that I've seen. in, in mm-hmm. so whether it's the mediation pro, pro program in Finland, um, the national restorative justice program of Costa Rica uh, or Peru, both of them have national uh, restorative justice programs for young people uh, or programs in the U S like impact justice and common justice that are, you know, focused on, keeping, you know, avoiding making prison the true last resort. Um, And then I would say, you know, I I guess I'll give the obvious answer, which is in in Scandinavia. I mean, I've been to open prisons in Norway uh, and in Finland, and those are very humane, truly correctional environments, uh, scenarios where people are able to remain integrated in the community while still, you know, addressing whatever needs they have and paying whatever amends in the context of a, you know, I hesitate to even call it prison because it's so different from prison as to be worthy of another name. Uh, There's an open, a similar facility for youth that I was in, in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, that's now expanding um, in the Netherlands. So, you know, I think the ones without bars, the ones where there's an open access to the world, to the community, uh, we can't, you know, I I really do believe that we're going to look back in however many years it takes and say, I cannot believe we ever thought that sticking someone in an old Victorian building that stinks of shit and keeping them there, no matter how much education or programs we get, like, Why would you think that warehousing somebody away in any environment that doesn't involve the normal world would actually make somebody come out a better person and make our societies, our communities safer? 
And I really do think we're going to look back at this the way we look back at the guillotine or the stocks or any of these forms yeah. of punishment that just seem like barbaric and, and illogical as well. Yeah. Because it's, it's, I suppose, prison itself is a relatively recent phenomenon in the history of humankind, you know, and it's, people find it very hard to imagine a society where you don't have a prison. It's just something that's accepted. You commit a crime, you go to prison. But that hasn't always been the way, sure it hasn't. Would you like to give the people that are watching that maybe just a little brief introduction of to how the prison actually came about? Yeah, so um, it's I write about this in my book and learned a lot about prison history. But in in a nutshell, um, there have always been holding cells. There have always been prison um, prisons as holding cells, but they were seen as the path to justice, not justice itself. So you know, somebody might be held while it was determined what um, you know how he would make a, he or she would make amends for the crime or the harmful act. And prisons, as we know them today, as, you know, okay, you do the crime, do the time, a murder equals 10 years, a uh, robbery equals five, uh, kind of came to be in the early 19th century when, and it really was something that was built in the U.S. with two modern prisons in Philadelphia and in New York. And they were built on European ideas that were circulating around in the so-called age of reason. Um, which makes sense because it coincided with the birth of the factory, with the birth of capitalism and industrialism mm -hmm. and this whole idea that you can just, you know, create a factory for human beings that would correct them or fix them, right? Um, much in the way that you had a factory that was producing, um, you know, bread or whatever else. And so uh, the U.S. built these two modern prisons and then via, at this time, of course, you know, so much of the world was controlled by the colonial forces. And so all of these leaders from the colonial, uh, the, the colonial rulers, the colonial empire came to visit these prisons, particularly Eastern State. It's a very famous prison. It's in Philly uh, and it's now a museum. More than uh, 350 prisons around the world have been modeled after Eastern State. And, and I've seen a whole lot of them <laughs> in my travels. I'll just, you know, pull up to a prison and there is like, there it is the same exact uh, prison that I've already seen in, you know, 10 other countries. And so you then had them impose this on their uh, colonial empires as well. So in Santiago, Chile, you get a prison that's modeled after Eastern in Rwanda, you get a prison that's modeled after Eastern. Why? Because at the time of building, they were colonial. Um, they were they were part of the colonial empire of whether it's France, Spain, Belgium, the UK, uh, and so and that pervades justice systems globally. I mean, we've been uh, we at Incarceration Nations Network have been throwing around this idea of decolonizing justice a lot because the reality is. The UK, just to take the example of the UK system, it's been imposed in countries where it doesn't apply. The legal system of the UK exists in Nigeria. It exists in Ireland. It exists in, um, in places where yeah, yeah. it does not uh, really have any relevance to the society there. And that's a colonial, uh, a piece of colonial residue. It's a legacy of colonialism and imperialism and white supremacy. And so there needs to be a rethinking not only of prison, but of entire systems that are holdovers from the colonial regime. Um, and so a big part of the work that uh, I and Incarceration Nations Network, we're trying to do is to say, let's stop this, you know, this stupid copycatting game that resulted in prisons in the first place and say, how do we innovate? How do we think about what justice systems look in ways that are appropriate to a given society, not as colonial um, imposition? And, you know, it's America plays its role now, too. Yeah, Sorry, exactly. It's in, it, like you were saying in your book that you were saying in your book that the American prison now is like one of the main things they've exported. Nearly every country runs that American style prison. And it, it was funny, you were talking about the legacy of colonialism, like there's buildings in Ireland, old government buildings in Ireland, that government buildings in Singapore and in New Delhi, it was the same architect, they looked the exact same, 
because they're all from the, 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 they were all British colonies. So all those places where Britain shouldn't have been in the first place, if we can say that, um, there's still legacies there. And in our judicial systems, you know, we have the Whigs and all this kind of Britishness, you know. So, um, but can I touch, uh, like you, you spoke a while ago about um, restorative justice and stuff like that. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about Rwanda and South Africa, where you had deep divisions amongst groups and, and society, um, where you had very bad crimes, um, but they had a kind of an alternative means of dealing with them and rebuilding the communities. Yeah, um, so the the book actually starts in Rwanda, um, focusing on the legacy of the genocide, um, and then continues in South Africa, another country that's sort of been defined by a, a grave, uh, egregious regime uh, and and event series of events, um, namely apartheid, and it tries to think about the idea of how do we how do we deal with grave acts of harm in terms of asking how do we punish the people who did wrong, but in terms of asking what are the needs of those who survived and how do we bring about peace and restoration, which is a whole other paradigm. Um, and it's the anti-punitive paradigm. It's the one that says we need to fo- center survivors of harm in our criminal justice systems and in our scenarios of national harm, and I would say this is true in the U.S. too, in terms of our legacy of slavery, of white supremacy, of genocide of indigenous peoples. Um, how do we recognize these harms and what are the needs of those who've survived them? And in my time in Rwanda, in my time in South Africa, um, both countries that I continue to go back to um, and learn from and, and use as kind of uh, a point of wisdom um, and a point of knowledge stimulation, uh, what what I came to learn, and also I, I should say in my time uh, with people who have survived great harm here in the U.S. as well and all around the world, what, what you come to learn is that what we assume to be the needs of the people who have been harmed are not actually their needs. Um, we assume that retribution, that punishment, that revenge is going to bring people to peace and healing. Um, but in fact, studies have shown us that it doesn't bring people that peace and healing and, and, uh, and, and, and sort of holistic uh, coming together. And in fact, the restorative approach that involves true accountability for the person who has caused the harm and uh, reparations and engagement with the person that that, that that individual has caused harm to is ultimately brings people far more healing and brings about much more peace. And, uh, you know, I- I'm summarizing and speaking broadly here, but the idea is that Again and again, we see that restorative approaches to justice are far more successful in terms of, and we gauge success by uh, the person who has experienced the harm and their feeling about the process and also about what continues to bring about lasting peace in a community um, and restorative approaches being far more successful in that regard. Uh, And Uh, I learned this in Rwanda through spending time with young genocide survivors who were working through the genocide, um, having been very, very young when it happened. And in South Africa, by working in Polesmore Prison, which is one of the most notorious prisons in the world, a very, um, very harmful, trauma-inducing place full of violence um, and, and all kinds of dysfunction that is a legacy of apartheid. Um, and the other thing that it's important to recognize in that context is, again, um, when we talk about second chances, we're forgetting about the fact that huge swaths of the community have not had first chances. And so whether that's because of race or because of class and, um, you know, or a whole other heap of factors, again, we have to come back to this fact of, you know, the illusion of free will in these contexts when we have designed radically unequal society, we have engineered radically unequal societies all over the world that are going to produce crime inevitably. Um, and so I am a big proponent of the of restorative approaches. It's not the answer, the magic bullet. There is no magic bullet. Justice is about 
radical experimentation in lots of different kinds of things, including, most importantly, investment in underserved communities that reduces crime in the first place. Um, but but I think that there's enormous power and, and force to uh, successful restorative approaches. Yeah. One last thing before and I let you I let you go on. The last points is females in prison in Ireland. Um, I suppose one of the main, a couple of the main differences between the female and the male prison population is in general, in general terms, when the child is when there's addiction in the home, the mother is left with the child. And when that mother goes to prison, it brings a lot of shame on the mother. Whereas it's not really like that for the father. If the father leaves home, it's typical. It's 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 not seen as anything abnormal. But there's a lot of shame comes with the mother. Um, my time working in addiction and homeless services here in my home city is females tend to have gone through a lot of domestic violence, sexual sexual violence. Um, they don't get the visitors in prison like a man would get. Like I've seen it myself where... A man who he'd have the partner, they'd be passing them up um, Nike trainers and tracksuit bottoms and and you know money and for cigarettes and stuff like that. But when she goes to prison, she's on her own. You know, what was your experience of dealing with females in prison in America and around the world? Well, you just summed it up um, because that is the universal story uh, of, of women in prison and women are the fastest rising prison population globally. I mean, when you look at the numbers in some countries, even in the last 10 years, um, it's actually mind blowing a country like Brazil, a country like the U S a country like El Salvador, where you're just seeing, you know, explosions in the rates of women in prison, um, who are predominantly and overwhelmingly victims of the war on drugs. Uh, I mean, Overwhelmingly, what you see with women who are incarcerated is that they're incarcerated for being small time players in um, drug trades and and much easier for a government to net uh, than necessarily the big players. And so um, women are overwhelmingly victims of this, you know, ignorant war on drugs. And they're because of being parents and, and often primary caretakers, as you say, when you incarcerate one woman, you're often directly incarcerating more than, far more than that. Um, and that is certainly true for men as well. I don't discount the importance of males, you know, male parenting. Yep. Um, and so, you know, we have to recognize that the crisis of, of incarcerated, uh, you know, children who are incarcerated by proxy, in essence, is an overwhelming crisis around the world. Um, but certainly what you're seeing with women is an impact on families that is often uh, devastating and irrevocable. And yes, you're right to say that women are often forgotten about. They're not. They don't get the kinds of visits that men get. Um, and they are much more stigmatized, as you say, uh, that, you know, it's almost it's, it's kind of normal for the guy to leave the family structure for a while. Um, whereas a woman, you know, sometimes and especially in countries that have certain ideas about gender dynamics, as I mentioned, Southeast Asia, in my book, I write about Thailand, um, where, you know, I mean, these are countries where the war on drugs is having devastating effects on on the community at large, uh, but particularly on women and women are stigmatized well after they get home from prison. So it's it's vastly destructive and. And again, not making us any safer. I mean, I think it's so important to keep pointing that out. We are not just destroying lives for good reason, for the greater good. We're destroying lives and we're creating more unsafe communities. Because when you destroy family structures and when you, when you destroy access to opportunities and jobs and you know all of the things that come with the collateral consequences of incarceration, you're, you're only making us less safe. And so, you know, it's important to keep pointing out that this isn't only a matter of this is evil and harmful and destructive, but it's also just dumb. It's also just not getting us the results that we allegedly would like, globally speaking. Yeah, but I, hopefully, ho hopefully we're moving away from the war on drugs now. I know in Ireland we're trying to go towards a decriminalisation, though it is very slow. We have a kind of a decriminalisation, but it's only for if you get caught with your first two offences, which is not really relevant if you're in a chronic addiction. 
you know, in other in other countries around Europe, you have decriminalization uh, at varying levels. You have it in Canada and Australia, some parts of America as well. So maybe we're moving away from that legacy, another American legacy, the war on drugs. Um, I suppose while we're while we're talking about drug policy, I just want to ask you one last thing, and I promise I let you go. Then I was reading something recently about um prisons in in Holland in the Netherlands being so empty that they're shipping in prisoners from Norway and that maybe it was down to the Dutch liberal drug policy where they don't lock up everybody that's caught with drugs you know and I think for an Irish prison context and a lot of prisons around the world a lot of the prisons are populated by drug addicts people that use drugs people that have been caught with drugs or done petty offenses because of their addiction do you think that a decriminalization model would do a lot to end mass incarceration or to help people reintegrate back into society by providing maybe a, a health response as opposed to criminal justice? Mm-hmm. So, yes, um, overwhelmingly, uh, the harm reduction approach is the only rational one. Um, and so I'm, a, you know, in favor of, of legalization, not even decriminalization, because I think that's creating a lot of strange gray areas and still plenty of potential for police mm. misconduct and, you know, all of the problems. Um, so I think the harm reduction approach, I think, though, it's important to point out that it's still varies quite a bit from country to country. And in the US, for instance, while we overwhelmingly have a problem, you know, with with responding to drugs, um, to illegal substances with incarceration, we could let out all those convicted of uh, drug offenses tomorrow and we'd still have the largest prison population in the world because we have a problem with violence. And um, and that that mm. is a reality that we need to confront. And so I don't want to Uh, While I think that there are many countries for whom really it's overwhelmingly an issue of just stupid drug policy, uh, there are still also countries that have to address, I mean, the U.S. is a violent nation and we need to address that legacy of violence and we need to figure out, you know, how to reckon with it and how to build, build lasting peace. And so we can't reduce it to only being a drug issue. Um, it's also a violence issue. It's also a an inequity issue, um, and a racism issue, and a classism issue, and you know, and a sexism issue. And so, until we kind of take on all of those isms, uh, because we also have to look at where does where does where does drug use stem from? You know, what drives people now? And and I am a big believer that one can be a healthy drug user. You know, to to cite Dr. Carl Hart, who's a, who's a friend and a mm. colleague. Um, I, you know, it's perfectly possible to use drugs um, and, and lots of people can use drugs in a perfectly healthy fashion. But when we look at the unhealthy use of it and we look at levels of trauma around the world and, you know, that comes back to all those isms, the racisms, the classisms, the sexism. So until we're taking on in a systemic way, all of the things that we have built in our society that are messed up, that are not allowing people to live well. Um, then we're not really going to get anywhere. So we can't just sort of simplify it to this one thing, um, but rather always think about it in the big picture kind of holistic sense. Exactly. And you make a good point there as well. You know, you talk about restorative justice, education programs, decriminalization, legalization. None of these are silver bullets and they will be fruitless unless you're addressing general inequality and, you know, um, as you said, the classism, sexism, racism, all these things, you know, there's no, like, what I was writing in, in an article I wrote recently is like, drug policy is irrelevant if you're going to still produce all these inequalities, you know, if you still have segregated poor people here and well-to-do people here, um, travellers in this part of the world, you know, if you have all that and these traumas, people are growing up in structural violence and childhood traumas, the drugs are always going to be the coping mechanism in lieu of anything else. So it's a good point, there's no silver bullet and it needs to be, uh, yeah, that's why we, we, we try not make this podcast political because... Um, you need everybody on board. It can't be a partisan issue. You know, it's something that it has to be cross-party support. You know, because drug users, people that are in prison, they're not other people. They are. They are Irish. They are American. We are those people. You know, it's just an extension of our society. And I think that we need to really embrace that and you know just try to help each other 
Um, and look, we're doing what we can do here. You're doing what you, you, you can do there and abroad. So well done to you. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I really enjoyed it. I could have talked with you for much longer. And please, God, we get to meet in person someday. Oh, we will. It's been my pleasure. I'm definitely coming to Ireland, you know, as soon as the world opens up again. So I look forward to meeting you guys in person. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much, Boz. Thank you. And look, as Joe Biden is president now, there's never been a, a better opportunity for a couple of ex-cons to get into America. <laughs> I'm saying, I know, if you need me to write any letters, just say the word, I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Excellent, excellent. Great to meet me, Thanks, you guys. Buzz. Keep me posted Thanks, on Buzz. everything. Take care. Okay. Excellent. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.